Hello, today at evening prayer, uh, March 15th, we are starting into the book of Ecclesiastes. What a fun book, right? I mean, it's one that, I mean, if you're a regular church goer, you've probably heard of it, but not a lot of Christians know much about this book. It's one of those short-ish books in the Old Testament with a funny name, and it's just sort of floating around there. It's famous, if anything, for quoting that nice song by the birds, turn, turn, for everything there is a season, a time to live, a time to die, a time to gather stones, a time to cast away stones. Okay, I guess that song quotes from this book. But that's in chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, and for a lot of people that seems to be all that they know about it. Either that or the slogan or motto that the author comes back to again and again, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. Or, if you're familiar with it in the New International Version, the NIV Bible, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Vanity of vanities is more of the traditional uh, translation that you also find in the ESV, the English Standard Version of the Bible. So what is this book? Who wrote it? Where did it come from? And what's going on here? Ecclesiastes is one of those books with a strange title. Uh, it comes from the Hebrew Kohalath, or Kohalat, which is difficult to translate. It has some sort of churchy tone to it because it's related to the word for the assembly or congregation of the people. So when you put it in through Latin, you get to ecclesiastical, which you know has to do with the assembly or the church. And so it's called Ecclesiastes in English, usually. But you could also call it the preacher, the teacher, the sage, the professor, if you like, uh, the churchman. <laughs> so it's just a, a tricky one to understand. Some, it's not untranslatable. It's just difficult to translate without a fuller sense of the context of where this exactly came from. Now, it is sometimes asserted that this book was also written by King Solomon, uh, and that is not necessarily true. Um, we have the introduction at the beginning of the book, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So there's, you know, an, an inference um, or um, some sort of association with a son of David, and we have to remember that uh, when you talk about someone being the son of somebody, uh, it could be any ancestor at all, or any descendant at all, rather. Uh, so you know, Sol it doesn't have to be Solomon after him. It could be any king that follows him. And when you look at the usage of the word son in, uh, in Hebrew, in the Old Testament literature, you'll find that a son can also be a disciple, a student. So this is... Um, clearly in the tradition of Solomon and making an appeal to Solomonic literature and wisdom, so to speak, but it's not uh, straightforwardly from Solomon himself. You get another hint of this in verse 16 of chapter 1, where it says, I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. So in one hand, on one hand, that sounds a lot like King Solomon because he was great. He was well known for having acquired great wisdom and you know experience and wisdom and knowledge and all that stuff. But then his, you know, the way he describes himself, all who were over Jerusalem before me, uh, all, all the kings before Solomon, you know, there was David, and that's it. All who were over Jerusalem before me. You know, you could say there was King Saul before David, but Saul did not reign from Jerusalem. So uh, this is clearly invoking the spirit of Solomon as, um, as a source, perhaps, but um, most likely this is not written by King Solomon directly. Uh, this is more likely Koheleth, the preacher, some leader, of some sort of leader or, or, or minister or priest in the Jerusalem temple, and he is writing this book. 
And so what is this book about, this e Ecclesiastes? Well, as it famously begins uh, his discourse in chapter one, he says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? So there's, there's that. <laughs> what, um, <laughs> depressing? No, not depressing, cynical, very cynical and very, um, very questioning. This book might be difficult for some Christians to read because you're not supposed to question your faith. What is all this vanity stuff? You know, everything has a reason. Everything has a purpose. God knows what he's doing. Okay, yeah, well, thanks for that nice, helpful theological answer. But, you know, sometimes people have pain in their lives. Sometimes things happen in the world around us that we have no control over, and we wonder what God is up to. And we wonder, what was the point of all the other things I did in my life when it's just going to be undone by, you know, some stupid plague or some famine or this other disaster or war or thing that happens or unexpected death? So this book is exploring, without holding back, the question of, of, of the meaning of life, really. I mean, this is speculative wisdom, um, wisdom literature that asks questions. This is in uh, contrast to prudential wisdom, like the book of Proverbs, where you're focused on prudence, um, you know, nice sayings that are good pieces of advice for, for life. This is speculative wisdom, asking the questions. What is the point? What is going on? And so he introduces himself later in chapter one. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, it is all vanity and a striving after wind. Actually, if I remember correctly, um, there's a play on words there. Um, all is vanity and a striving after wind. Uh, the word for vanity uh, in, in Hebrew is something akin to a breath or a vapor or like a puff of smoke or something and and then a striving after wind or you know whatnot so you've got you know the whole like the wind spirit puff of air sort of thing you know going on right there so he's using parallelism of similar words to get this picture across that life and its contents and its events are like this breath like a like you know spraying from a spray bottle and it's gone so what was the point of all that life? What was the point of all that hard work? What was the point of raising that family? What was the point of anything at all? That's a big and serious question. And so he explores this question in many different ways throughout the book. Uh, for the most part, going at it from a secularist or a humanist perspective. Just what do I see in the world around me? What have I experienced in my life? What have I observed? And how can I make sense of this? And so you just cycle through the absurdities, the vanities, the emptiness of life, and all the problems that can befall someone, and just bring all the good and bad things in the world to the same end, death. Everyone and everything dies. All good things come to an end. In the end, we are as uh, lifeless as when we were not yet conceived. So what is the point? Why does anything matter? Uh, but what makes this a Christian book or a religious book at all, um, if you, you know, account for its Old Testament function before Christ, as well as um, now in the church, uh, this book does not ultimately land in the world of nihilism. So although the questions it asks and the types of questions that it asks 
are very relevant and very on point with many of our cultural issues and questions today. What's the point of this? Are, isn't my body just a meat sack for my soul? Isn't um, you know work and pleasure and play and whatever all just you know frivolities that you fill your life with until you die? So it asks all these questions in, in various ways, but it arrives at an answer. It arrives at the, at the answer that, you know, even though everything ends, everything still matters. Because in the end, God judges all things. God measures and weighs all things. And so the moral of the story is kind of, you know, the, the same thing that you learn in Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, you can ask all these questions about life, you can explore and observe everything, and it will not make sense until you know the Lord. So as we start reading through this book in evening prayer over the next week or two, uh, next two weeks or thereabouts, um, have these questions in mind, and don't be afraid of the tough and hard questions that the preacher Koheleth asks, because these are very real questions, very real experiences, and I mean, all you have to do is look outside and drive down Main Street with all the closed shops at this time of uh, quarantine and pandemic, and you will see just how vapor-like life can be in just a puff of COVID-19, the economy, the towns, almost everything comes to a very sudden standstill. Um, you know, you can, maybe you can hear, the kids are still playing, life is going on uh, in other ways, but, you know, just how suddenly things can change so much. So Ecclesiastes is a great book for the questioner, for the cynic, for the one who is burned out, for the one who wants to believe in God, wants to believe in Jesus, but doesn't quite make sense of the pain and suffering in the world. And this book really, kind of like the book of Job, really helps us process the questions and be honest about the pain and, and apparent meaninglessness of life. So enjoy Ecclesi Ecclesiastes, and if you've never read it before, please do read it with us in the next couple weeks. This is a fantastic book in the Old Testament. God bless.